more of a conversation. Look, you and I know each other for four years. It's hard to make it formal, right? I can't. I think... <laughs> so it's more of a conversation, which I think actually is good because like these conversations don't happen that often. Yeah. And uh, so thank you so much, Dr. Cabrera, Ramiro Cabrera. So I'll, I'll call you Ram if it's okay during the conversation. Sure. Uh, so it has been uh, about four years that you and I know each other and we have worked with each other. We have had good share of disagreements and, and fights, but I think I have nothing less than 100% respect for everything you do and the work that you have done for patients and for the medical community as well. I really appreciate you being here. Thank you. No, please. It's my pleasure. Uh, as always, uh, whatever we can do for patients, it's, it's better. And thanks to you, many patients, if I can say a thousand of patients, even sometimes media patients can get to really good surgeons as well as surgical teams and multidisciplinary approach. So it's really good the work that you have done with iCareer. I think that, uh, as I told you, since I met you, it was something that must be done many years ago. And endometriosis, it's like any other specialty or subspecialty in medicine. Uh, you have a brain tumor, you need someone uh, that's not only a neurosurgeon. You have to have a, a specific specialty for some brain tumors. As well, like in, in OBGYN, if you have any specific condition, there are doctors for HPV, there are doctors for reproductive uh, medicine, and there are doctors for endometriosis, and that's it. I love, I love the introduction and thank you so much for the credit that you give us. I want to just follow your introduction. Can you, I, I am very interested. I know a little bit of it, but I never got to dig deep in that. Like what's the history of Ram Cabrera? How did you get into medicine and became an excision specialist? Now you are this world leader in this space, obviously. I know it goes back to the family. Please, please tell me. I want to, I want to hear about this. Well, it's a really interesting story. Uh, well, for me, not, but for many, for many people, it's interesting. Uh, well, I started med school at 15 years old, and this is because of my father. And my father was the president of oncology at that time. So my sister and myself uh, went under medical school. And because it takes around seven years here in Mexico, six and a half years, and my dad decided to put us really early at, at medical school. With his contacts in the director of the university, he made that possible. I have all my relatives, uh, almost all of them are doctors, even since my grand grandfather and, and grandfather, they are doctors as well. So uh, the only thing I have I have heard and probably seen my whole life it's uh, the the doctor, you know, in the in the medical history. Because of this, also I I went really early to medical school. I even started earlier to enter to the OR with my father. <laughs> because my father uh, used to to help uh, with their patients, uh, so we started really early to understand what surgery, their responsibility, and all the things that we it's in, going on in the OR because it's like a temple, you know, like any other religion. You have to know the customs and also you have to know the habits and everything else. So he believed, uh, and I think it was good and bad. Because when you're 15 years old, you're, you're, and probably psychology is not, it's not like a totally mature enough to be in the, in the new university. Med school, it's so immersive that you just study. And thanks to God, I, I finished med school at 21 years old. So I was already a physician, a general physician at 21 years old. And I started my specialty in OBGYN at 22. Here in Mexico, there is four years. So at 26, uh, I was already a uh, OBUIN. Uh, I, I dedicated a little bit into uh, endometriosis because uh, something that you already know that uh, one of my sister uh, have endometriosis. So uh, since the early beginning of her menses, she started having really bad symptoms. Even my father used to normalize that symptoms because at that point uh, there was no knowing. That's why I always tell everyone. All doctors, all of them are good doctors. Uh, my grandfather, my father, I do think that they can give their lives to patients. Uh, uh, they give everything just for a patient to be. To be. But the problem is that uh, at that point in technology and also medical education, the endometriosis wasn't something that we do know that exists, but we only knew the old ways of treatment. 
So even my father, who was a president of oncology of the full country, used to normalize the pain. He used to believe that a pain during menses was normal because as he told tell us by shame, a pain is not like a fever. In a fever, you use a thermometer and you see that someone has a fever. But when someone has pain, there is no equipment that we can see the amount of pain that the patient has. That means that it's not objective. It's subjective. So even though my sister was with a lot of pain, my father used to tell them like, that's normal. It will get better after you get a little bit older. He used to give, you know, like oral anticonceptives. He was an oncologist, so he has a lot of friends. Probably the best gynecologist in Mexico. And that's the, the classic, the classic history. My sister went to the top of the tops in Mexico. And the only thing they told them is like, it's normal. They used, uh, you know, normal MRIs, normal ultrasound. They didn't find nothing. Uh, they only give anticonceptives. The pain keep going. The adverse effects of the anticonceptive keep going. I used to even took my sister. I do remember something that went into my mind really early in my life. That when I was like 14, uh, my sister fainted in the in the uh, in the shower, and I had to, you know, like carry her out because of pain. So I saw through her life in uh, probably 15, 20 years, uh, the amount of pain, how it was growing. Uh, she underwent to to surgeries, even with my dad at that point, uh, laparotomies. Obviously, imagine the the love of a father to her daughter, it's something that cannot be measured. So my dad didn't want to do a bad surgery. They just didn't even knew how to. So even a family, even a, a friends of my father, my father was a gynecologist. They used to try to do ablation. And so she started getting, you know, more and more uh, pain and dysfunction. And I do remember we even went to the U.S. to one of our really big, big hospital over there. We spent a lot of money. And they did another ablation and they were like, oh my God. So thankfully, when I went to Europe and started seeing that there was a high quality treatment with Professor Arnaud Battisti in France, see Mario Balzoni in Italy and many other world-class uh, surgeons as well as centers, I started seeing there was a mapping of deep endometriosis that we even took our, uh, my sister to do that mapping. And then thankfully, when I went to with William uh, with, at Brazil, I specialized even a little bit better for deep endometriosis surgery for a year. And then uh, I finally did the surgery my, to my sister. And thanks to God right now, she's without any more pain. And uh, I was telling her that, that the best uh, gift in my life is to see someone that I love so deep, deeply, like my sister, to be with my nephews. And she's with a good quality of life. So and that's uh, something I wanted to replicate uh, because I want to treat a patient like if they were my sister. I, see, I saw my sister to 20 years of pain, uh, probably more. And I, if there was a doctor who could help her at the beginning, I, I, you know, it, it will be something that I, will, I wish that anyone in the world could have and not wait 20 years for it to, to finish. That's amazing. No matter how many times I hear it, and honestly, anytime I hear it, I get emotional, you know? Yeah, I'm wow. sorry. But it's something that that probably many, 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 even doctors, many even doctors that were really close to me, they told me one time that uh, endometriosis is not everything. Yeah, I do think that, yes, I cannot put my full life to work. But every time I woke up, I woke up with, you know, with a meaning because I, I do remember my sister, you know, in pain. I do remember my sister painting. I do remember the loss of many partners and even a husband. I do remember she lost even pregnancies. And I do remember how the quality of life, you know, was really bad and how she told me she was depressed. And every time I woke up and even really close doctors to me told me that uh, endometriosis is not everything. It's not everything. But if I can give a meaning to my life, uh, as uh, you know, it's not only me. There's someone that is trying to, you know, work against hunger, and there's someone try to work against war, and you know, like everything. I do think that the the meaning of my life it's this is to help patients as I help my sister. So I I do see patients like they're with my family. So I try to even I, I'm not perfect. I'm far from perfect, but I'm try to you know give the best. So they can arrive home and be with their loved ones and at least, you know, be without pain. Amazing.
So you mentioned about your, like how you went to Europe and saw Mario Marzoni, Arnold Batiz, then you joined William Kondo and you learned excision. Now, after so many years of excision and seeing the best of the best, what's the most difficult thing about excision? That's a really good question. Well, excision surgery, it's really difficult because endometriosis by definition, it can be in other organs. For this, I even tried to share the screen with you guys so you can understand a little bit better uh, what's endometriosis. So I hope I can share it well and tell me if you can see my screen right now. Yes? Yes. Yes. So the first thing that we have to know and understand is what's the definition of endometriosis. We know now that endometriosis is a, a systemic inflammatory disease in which a tissue similar to the endometrium, let's all remember that the endometrium is the the tissue that sheds every month during menses uh, in any patients with a uterus. So uh, this tissue similar to the endometrium uh, is born and grow outside the, the uterine cavity. And what it causes is a systemic inflammation uh, process. So depending on the localization, the size of the tissue that we can call nodule soft plate, it's a symptomatology that the patient may suffer. As you're seeing here in the screen, uh, here's a representation, a drawing, of the female pelvis, and you can see the bladder, the, the uterus disorgan, the shape of a beard, the ovary, and the uterus salpinx. So sometimes endometriosis can affect the, the other organs like the, the bowel, that's my specialty. So uh, as you are seeing right there, if you have a bowel nodule or if you have a bladder nodule, or sometimes endometriosis can even affect other organs like uh, the pelvic nerves or even the diaphragm. Mm -hmm. So uh, because of this, uh, I just did even uh, in the weekend a uh, case of a really big nodule in the ureter. That is the organ that takes the urine from the kidney to the bladder. It can be really, really devastating for the quality of life of women as well as for the function of each organ. So uh, because of this, when we are going to do something that is called excision therapy, we must provide uh, something that is to take away the tissue. Uh, the old the old days, my father and grandfather, great doctors, but they are not experts in endometriosis, used to do ablation. That means just to burn the, the disease. Uh, because of this, uh, all the time the disease wasn't taken out. So they have they used to have a lot of, uh, they used to say that it was recurrence, but it's not recurrence, it's persistence of the disease. And uh, now we have to do excision, that is to take away the tissue from the organs. But as you can imagine, uh, if you have a, a nodule in the bladder, in the ureter, or, or another organ, uh, it's really hard sometimes to take the nodule away without hurting the organ, without causing complication or sometimes dysfunction, because it can get even into the nerves of the, or the organ. So it's really, really, really a advanced surgery that you have to go or there underwent to many years of a post speciality. Uh, education, even uh, something that we can say like a subspecialty and even more, like uh, in Mexico, we call it high specialty. So it's a, it's a really advanced surgical procedure that even if you're an oncologist like my father, that we used to do like big, big, big cases in which you can take each organ away and whatsoever, and, and this type of surgery is even a little bit harder because it's not just to take away the organ, it's also to preserve the function. So uh, that's why we have to like make a, a specialization in this type of surgeries. By shame, right now worldwide, it's estimated to be less than 200 centers, and that's a lot, that can uh, provide multidisciplinary approach with presurgical diagnosis, the mapping, and also a multidisciplinary approach with a, a multidisciplinary team of experts. It's not just to call the colorectal surgeon, who is only seeing cancer or hemorrhoids and has never ever seen endometriosis. That's the one who will not complete a surgery. Is to call a colorectal surgeon or a pelvic complete surgeon who's doing these type of surgeries day by day so they can understand the disease and take away the disease without hurting the patient. And uh, obviously this with other specialty as well. But you cannot call a cardiothoracic surgeon who has ever been uh, not only in the diaphragm. You have to call someone that is seen every every week and every every week. So that's the most important part. If we can uh, like really emphasize it in that worldwide, the disease will change in history. I see. So uh, 
This is amazing. So basically the most difficult part right here, I mean, everything about this is difficult. The most difficult that you mentioned is keeping the normal tissue alive and undamaged when you're cutting as much endometriosis lesion as you can out because of the nerve involvement, bladder and ureter and every other normal organ. It's amazing. You mentioned there are less than 200 centers. Is there any like organization or like certification like that certifies the centers like i care better certifies the the surgeon yeah yeah has there been any or like what's your thought on that well right now there are three certifications worldwide uh, and four it's uh, uh there's a new one the one that i do think that it's really good is to certify the surgeon because even though endometriosis will never be just a surgical procedure and that's it i remember that we have a post-op care and physiotherapy in europe we will talk about that after uh, but uh, to do a good quality surgery by a good surgeon with a high volume, it's mandatory. That should be really important. So that's why I think that I care is, it's a mandatory thing to do worldwide. The second thing is right now the Surgical Review Corporation, that it's a, a organization that also certify other types of centers. Already this year, last year, sorry, they created a certification for quality and multidisciplinary approach. And that means that they check you, like in the US, the quality. That means that uh, how many amount of patients you see per year, and that you have all nutrition, physiotherapy, pain medicine, doctors, whatsoever. They do not care about uh, the quality of surgery, but they do care about quality of multidisciplinary treatment. That you have a good colorectal surgeon with credentials for endometriosis and everything else. Also, the volume. The volume is important for, for them. The third certification that uh, is going right now in, in Latin America is in LATAM certification. That it's like the conjunction of both because we use iCareBear for certified surgeon. And uh, also, we do also ask for the center to send us that they have everything to take uh, care of patients with deep endometriosis. Since nutrition to physiotherapy, psychology, and everything. Uh, so Endolatam, I think it's good because Endolatam helped us a little bit with also something that we want to create, that uh, we have to remember that over 200 million women are affected worldwide. This is something really, really important. I will even share the screen again with you guys so you can understand a little bit better this. So uh, at least 200 million women are affected worldwide. That's really, really important to understand. That uh, number came up uh, if we take uh, in conjunction that one in each 10 women are affected. But that uh, incidence was uh, the incidence of my father and grandfather. That, that incident was uh, when we used to diagnose endometriosis by laparoscopy and biopsy. We do think that it's even over two, more than 200 million women right now worldwide. And right now, as you've seen here in the screen with me, we are, have an estimate about 25 million women are affected in the US, 10 million in Canada, 20 million in Mexico, 2 million in Guatemala, and around uh, 20 million in Brazil. And right now, uh, it's really uh, difficult to know, but we know that around uh, in North America, there are less than 15 centers that can approach a patient with a multidisciplinary approach. And that means with mapping, a uh, correct mapping that we have to remember, it's mandatory to do a protocol and uh, all mappings should come with uh, at least two classifications. One is the ADL, and the most important one is the ANSIAN score. Uh, that's really hard to find in the in the US, as you can remember, because right now, uh, all patients that have a, a clinical suspicion of deep endometriosis deserves and uh, must ask for an ANSIAN presurgical classification. And with this, we can clearly see if you have a nodule in other organ and the grade of, of of involvement in this organ, and obviously we can do a nice treatment and do a, a good presurgical uh, care. So uh, that's the the third classification, the Nolatan classification, and the fourth right now is the European League of Endometriosis classification that are trying to do the same as Nolatan, but in Europe. So I think that that type of classification are really good. And I think that it's mandatory worldwide for any anyone who is trying to treat patients with endometriosis to be certified. It's something that makes even safe for the patient's surgery as well as treatment. That's amazing. I am so basically I'm very impressed and I'm happy that there is some efforts. And you mentioned endolatam. Let's. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, some questions about endolatam later. But now that you mentioned that, and we are talking about certificates, 
So you mentioned about why it's important to have all these centers being certified. Can you tell me about what is Endolatam and why did you think we need Endolatam? Well, Endolatam came as the answer to fool a Latin America for the problem of the endometriosis. Uh, Latin America, the most countries are uh, developing countries or third world countries that by shame they're overpopulated like Brazil and Mexico. We have a large population as you can only imagine. And uh, by shame, we didn't have centers that even some centers from in Mexico, I feel even uh, really bad uh, to my heart, but some centers in Mexico 10 years ago was like a center for endometriosis. And when you went to that center, it was like, do you do mapping? It's like mapping, what's mapping? It's like, oh my God. And uh, do you perform excision? It's like, what's excision? And, and uh, do you have physiotherapy, psychology, nutrition? It's like, no. And it's like, oh my God, how can you even put that in your name, you know? So uh, Endolatan came as the answer from uh, 15 doctors that are world-renowned doctors, like Professor William Condo in Brazil, Professor Fernando Heredia in Chile, uh, myself and Dr. Armando Menocal in Mexico and many others through Latin America, that we had high volume centers. And we already took our learning curve. Uh, in Mexico, it took around for Frank five to seven years to get a center with everything inside of it. Uh, that means that the nutrition understand uh, food maps, uh, you know, diet, that the physiotherapy understand what's, uh, you know, like the, the specific uh, physiotherapy for endometriosis. To have the first neuropaleologist in Latin America, like Dr. Ana Sierra, and, you, you know, like get colorectal surgeons that even care about endometriosis. To go talk to a cardiothoracic surgeon who doesn't think that you're crazy because they didn't even think that endometriosis can get to the lung. So imagine, uh, you know, changing that in a, in a full country. So Endolatam came as the answer to help other developing countries to homogenize, you know, I know that I'm saying that correctly in English, but to put it at the same level as what we took seven years. And it's super working. When Endolatam came to Dominican Republic two, two years ago, the Dominican Republic didn't have nothing. They didn't even understand what was mapping, obviously nutrition therapy, and uh, there was no surgery. There was not even like the developing of minimal invasive surgery. You get me? So when Dominican Republic contact us, Guatemala contact us, El Salvador contact us, what we are, came was with the pool, uh, we give them everything, you know, it's like, this is mapping and I help your, your radiologist to get to that level. This is a uh, food maps uh, nutrition. Okay, so we have a good nutrition that already have a really big learning curve. So she can talk to the other nutritionists in Guatemala and they get in the same level. This is the type of surgery you have to get. So they come with me, they understand surgery with me. I teach them surgery so they can replicate the surgery over there, you know? And then sometimes we go to even to the to the country to, you know, solve really big cases like the one with involving the diaphragm in the in the intestine, the bladder at the same time. So we help them, you know, we have a proctorship program so that surgeon can have a less learning curve. They don't have to go to the seven years that took us. They have to go through one. In Dominican Republic right now, our the center who was with the Nolatam right now, they are doing the same as we are doing right here. You get me? So in one year, they do what we took seven. And Guatemala, the same first Congress, power resection. Oh my God, it was like, oh my God, this is out of this world. Yeah. Uh, it's a dream because, you know, and they're really thankful because we try to give them, you know, everything because this is uh, some doctors, and I'm really sad to say this, some doctors, and probably even myself, some years ago, wanted to be you know, the, the ego, they wanted to be the best. They wanted to be the, the quickest. I want to be the best. I want to be in the spotlight. I want to be the best surgeon in the world that can do anything. I think that's wrong. I think that they were, they was even like really jealous about teaching because there are people that have even better abilities than myself. And I can even say to you that clearly. And I hope that my fellows that are learning, learning with me, it's a mandatory for them to be even better than me. Because if they are not better than me, then I'm doing something wrong. If I can make them, you know, what I, took me many years to understand and I can, you know, process and then give it to them easier, they will develop new stuff. You get me? 
So that's something that has to be done worldwide. And by saying many of the old doctors that started in the majority's uh, adequate, care, adequate care, they, they, they start to get the ego too overinflated. And that's really wrong because countries like Guatemala, countries like El Salvador, that obviously probably Professor Batiste will never go to El Salvador because he has even Dubai, a really big country with a lot of money. So how can he help, you know, El Salvador, he can help uh, developing countries. So that was the meaning of Endolatam. Endolatam came to the answer to all of these millions of women affected that have even worse case than the ones that Europe and may get to an expert quicker or a little bit easier. That's amazing. Personal question. It's a very like advanced and progressive mindset that you transition from being the spotlight and being the best in the world to being like someone who wants to create the best in the world, like create more. What, what changed that mindset? Well, uh, that's really personal, but I will give it to you. When, when I started seeing that at some point, you know, even your ego gets a little bit or in play because I start doing surgeries that I have even seen my professors and I was doing surgery that they cannot even do in the same amount of time that I was even you know, compensating. I was like, oh my God, I'm getting really good. And my team is doing, uh, I know it, it's an example, you know, like in France, they used to do a bowel resection in four hours. Now I do it in one hour. And I was like, oh my God, now I'm, I'm there. You know, that, that professor I went to see uh, when I was really young. But then I started seeing something that probably they didn't saw before and something that a patient taught, taught me. Like not so many days ago or many months ago, I underwent to a, a kind of something sad in my life. And I was, you know, under the weather. I was a little bit, uh, you know, uh, not, not like everything, like super happy. And then a patient in Colombia, I was in Colombia and she told me, like, she was like, doctor, are you okay? It's like, well... I'm a little bit sad. It's normal. I'm a human being. I can be sad. I didn't even tell her why. And she told me like, well, I don't know if you understand, but you have done many things in your life and you have uh, changed many patients, probably thousands of them. I'm one of the patients who you changed my life. But right now, all over the world, because we do as a doctor things that we transcend to our being the best surgeon, like, oh my God, I want to be remembered as, you know, like they want to put me in my name in a hospital the name of my name in a technique and something like that. And this patient gave me something really important that she told me, you transcend as a doctor the moment that I arrive to my family and I give a hug to my son and I'm okay. Because every time I arrive to my home and I'm okay, I remember you because you changed my life. If I, you didn't do that type of approach, surgery, treatment whatsoever, I will never arrive to my family and give them love. And then I understand like, you know, like, oh my God, this is really, really important. And I was like, yes, you're totally right. I don't want to be the quicker surgeon because even that can cause complications. You want to be best. Oh, I did one in one hour. I want to do one in half an hour. And I don't care what it takes. No, the most important part in endometriosis is the patient. The most important part of endometriosis is that she goes home to the loved ones. You get me? And that's the way any surgeon should should be thinking of, not about money, not about being the best, not about having a, a thousand patients in one day. No, it's when they arrive home to the loved ones and they are okay. And that's how we should transcend each patient that we change and each patient they, they you know, uh, get to, to their families. That's uh, the amount of effort that we should be putting on. So I hope it may, I make it clear, but for me, it was really important. You made it perfectly clear and it's amazing to go through that transition. And that's uh, the mentality of really impactful people. I was very impressed that you want other people to be better than you. That, that makes a person even better than, than what they, in what they do. It's amazing. So I think there's, there's a lot to go to see. So can you just some quick questions, uh, who are the leaders of Endor Latam now? Right now, there are 15 of them, and I, I have a list, but I will give you the quick list. <laughs> it's yeah. uh, Professor William Condo from Brazil, uh, Dr. Uh, Fernando Heredia in Chile, Dr. Armando Menocal in Mexico, Dr. Krause, uh, the two brothers in Chile, Dr. Jesus Castellano in Venezuela, 
and myself and Manuel in Mexico. He was Jose Eugenio in Dominican Republic. The two guys from from uh, Guatemala. Oh my God, their names is uh, Hector and Hugo. They have the same, almost the same name. And I'm forgetting some of them. That's but Jordana. Eh, Jordan. Eh, Jordan. 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 Jordan is in Brazil. Yeah, there are also some ga- other guys in Brazil. <laughs> I'm forgetting. I'm so sorry. It's okay. But yes, they were the 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 founders. But now I think that in the lab time right now I don't know the list, but it's around 150 surgeons. This uh, the certified centers are around 25, I guess, in Colombia and things like that. That they have everything, even develop treatments for chronic pelvic pain. So I think oh, Uselio uh, from Brazil, and that sells an neuropolbiologist, Ana Sierra, and all of them. So there, it's really good because even they're working together in the LATAM as Ikebra is developing like a community. So some 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 of them, they're like, hey, I have this patient that has like, oh my God, I involvement in the nerve, blah, blah, blah. And then Uselio, who's an neuropolbiologist, is like, yes, do this. They'll send it to me. You get me? Also, something really beautiful about the Latam that we created is that there are uh, people from Bolivia. There was no expert in Bolivia. And then, like, oh, they contacted the Latam, like, can I come to your center in Brazil? Like, yes, of course, you can come. You can learn. Can I go to Mexico? Can I go to Chile? Yes, of course, you can come. Come and learn. You get me? And that doesn't cost any money. Uh, obviously, well, the money of traveling, but we do not. Pay, get paid. I think that endometriosis should never the education. I think that's something that education as everything in life should be free. But uh, it depends on, by shame also in the abilities of the surgeon. This is something that should be really be enhanced. The surgery uh, is like painting uh, or like to- playing the piano. Uh, you may have 10 years, 20 years of piano lessons. And you may play uh, something about Vivaldi, but Vivaldi and Chopin are composers. You get me? So there are innate uh, abilities. Uh, sometimes even when I do surgery, uh, even my companions, my my associates is like, how did you do that? And I was like, sometimes I'm like, I, I, to be truly true with you, I don't know. Sometimes I see the minimal detail. Sometimes I have to breathe and think again, okay, now I will do this. Sometimes I do a little bit there and then come back. It's like, how, how do you saw the nerve? How do you know where to cut? How do you know how to preserve the, the bowel? And sometimes I can tell you the truth. It's something that's inside of me. It's like, I saw the minimal details. It's like, yeah, I can cut there. And they're like, how can uh, even my uh, professor of mine, who's now an associate of, of myself, who was my oncology teacher, is like, sometimes you do not understand that you're seeing the screen where you're seeing something different that we are seeing. And it's hard because I'm seeing the nerve and they're seeing the ureter. there. <laughs> you get me? <laughs> and and it's, or I have in my head how not to damage the nerve and they're having in their head like how not to open the bowel or something like that. So uh, it's something hard sometimes, yes. This is absolutely amazing. So, you know, I, I play piano, so I completely resonate with what you say. That could be so different. Yeah, so, you can sometimes I know if you can compose, but if they tell you, oh yeah, let's compose like that's hard. Exactly. So let me I wanna, you know, obviously you have been talking about what you have done and like how you can differentiate things in the OR that and you see things. But you have been the driver of change in actual practice of endometriosis in some aspects, in my opinion, because obviously I'm talking to a lot of surgeons and I'm monitoring the industry because our role at iCareBetter is is monitoring the change and help change being made or even make the changes. So in, in some sense, I would say you are the most vocal global expert in some of the things that you're doing. And some of them really should appreciate you for doing this. The first thing is mapping, endometriosis mapping. It sounds like so obvious to you and so like, yes, of course you have to do it before the surgery. But you know, a lot of people don't even do an MRI before the surgery or don't even know what this is. Yeah. Can you start from the beginning? Like, how did you learn about it? How did you implement it? And why do you think this is such an important thing to do? Of course, this is really a mandatory thing to do. Uh, as I told you, my sister got endometriosis. So we can suspect endometriosis clinically. 
Uh, we already know the six Ds that is dysmenorrhea or pain during menses, dyskesia, dysuria, and everything else that, you know, are the inflammatory uh, symptoms during menses, like pain during defecation, bloatness, even sometimes frequency or urinary pain. And as soon as we suspect endometriosis, that we must remember that one in each 10 women have. So if you have a friend that have pain during menses, just by incidence, it's probably endometriosis. Uh, worldwide, they have been trying to diagnose endometriosis before going to surgery. Ten years ago, this was not in the map. This was not a, uh, uh, how do you say, like an added, it, it, was, it wasn't even uh, developed. Thanks to uh, Mario Malzoni, Professor Arnovatis, uh, Luciana Chamier, and many others around the world who started the high-quality treatment, they started seeing that a radiologist with a long lear learning curve, the ones that see endometriosis every day, can see deep endometriosis. For us to remind, there are three levels of endometriosis. One is peritoneal disease. That means that it's really, really uh, small and sometimes even hard to see for the human eye. A deep endometriosis, that means that it's a grade of infiltration. Uh, there used to be that more than three or five millimeters. Now, any grade of infiltration can be deep endometriosis and the famous ovarian endometrioma. So uh, the way of diagnosis this type of diseases, uh, it was, uh, they used to diagnose probably like a, a, a cyst, like a complex cyst uh, that was an endometrioma through uh, an office ultrasound. And then they went, like my father, into surgery. And they used to tell the patients that uh, we have to do surgery to see if you have endometriosis in other organs. Now, we know this is not true. Why? because the human eye cannot see through tissue. So even my father, when he entered to a, a laparoscopy, uh, the only thing that they can saw is attachment of the uterus to the rectum. Uh, no human eye can see the nodule size. No human eye can see the grade on involvement in the bowel. No human eye, the most important is the distance from the anal verge to see if we are going to do a bowel resection or not. Also in the bladder, we can only see the superficial layer of each organ. So uh, many other, many, uh, many special uh, radiologists, even like Luciana Chamier, and this is something groundbreaking. Luciana Chamier, uh, it's a friend of ours. Uh, she's a, a postdoctorate in Sao Paulo, and now she went to the U.S. to uh, to make this in one year. That is the first, uh, the first consensus in the first, uh, in the most important uh, magazine of radiology. That is now the levels of, of ultrasound in endometriosis that they're talking about mapping. So mapping of endometriosis started in Italy and France. Uh, they started uh, trying to prove that they can diagnose endometriosis before going to surgery. And they did it. Uh, but the problem is that it wasn't a normal ultrasound. They used to, uh, they saw that if they do the ultrasound without bowel preparation, they cannot see the nodules. If they do the ultrasound without seeing the diaphragm, the, the kidneys, and with a proper protocol or algorithm, then they will never see the nodules. And they understand as well that in the metrosis, by definition, it's outside the uterus. So uh, in an ultrasound, transvaginal ultrasound, we do not see only the uterus. We have to see the bladder, the vagina, the ureter, the bowel. And with this, we can see even through tissue, because the human eye cannot see and we can diagnose in a pre-surgical ma manner the, the nodules if it's affecting other organs. So the next time any uh, U.S. or Canada uh, doctor tells you, I have to do a, a laparoscopy to see if you have endometriosis, you have to remember, tell them no. The only thing that you have to see through a laparoscopy is when a mapping comes negative because obviously peritoneal disease is so mild that you cannot see it in a mapping. But... Uh, if they did not perform mapping before, then uh, they will enter without diagnosis and the human eye cannot see through tissue. So it's mandatory in red and in highlights to do a mapping and a correct mapping should be protocolized. Uh, this is something that we have even published many years ago. And the new protocol of mapping uh, should always be with a result that is in an, an ancient score. The ancient score can give us if you have an endometrioma that that's super easy to see. But if you have an endometrioma, you have a 80% chances to have endometriosis in other organs. So with the ancient protocol in a pre-surgical manner or fashion, we can see there's involvement of the bladder, the bowel, and the grade of involvement, 
the amount of nodules as the one that you're seeing here. Many patients go uh, and they found uh, uterine fibroids. We know now that if you have a fibroid, you have a 80% chances to have endometriosis. So even if you have a uterine myoma or fibroid, uh, you should go under a mapping because sometimes the fibroid is le the less important or the endometrioma is the less important. If you have a C3 nodule, that means that you have almost an obliterated nodule or something that can be subocclusive. And in the same surgery, in a full excision, in a one-shot surgery, we should take everything, you know, like the endometriosis or in sometimes even a, a radical surgery. So uh, now you understand a little bit better how the mapping came up. I do really feel really beautifully about uh, what Luciana Chamier work is doing in the U.S. I do think that in the next yeah, years, year. Luciana Chamier will change mapping in around the U.S. So they will get a little bit with more presorical diagnosis. But I do think that they have to really educate all the OBGYNs and general practitioners to understand that a laparoscopy diagnosis a surgery is something that it's from the old days. So that should never be offered to any patient. So I think this is important what you say, because there is a resistance not only by doctors, but also by some patients about MRI or non-surgical diagnosis. One thing that you said, maybe that's exactly where the things need to change is that if, if you have some unprotocol MRI read by an unprofessional radiologist, it's going to miss the disease probably like 90. So what you're yeah. saying is, oh, go ahead. Sorry, I, that's really important. That's really important that you just said it. It's not a normal MRI. It's an MRI that you have to put bowel gel, rectal gel, and a bowel inhibitory movement medication. I'm sharing the screen with you so you can understand a little bit better. So uh, the MRI is not a normal MRI. Uh, we should put like all the protocol. Where did I put this here? So uh, I don't even know if you knew, but uh, the MRI should be always protocolized in a, a adequate manner. Uh, also, uh, they are user, user dependent and the special preparation even. All of the women have done an ultrasound, but if they don't put the bowel uh, preparation to see the bowel layers, the ultrasound is the, the same as doing nothing. Uh, also the MRI, if you have an MRI without protocol, that means with uh, rectal and bowel gel, then you will never see the disease. So this is something that uh, should be uh, offered to the patients. And many of my patients come like, oh yeah, I have done one or two MRIs. And you see the MRIs, there's no rectal gel, right? And it's like, no, they didn't put, then it's like nothing. This is like throwing the money to the, the trash can. This is fascinating. In my opinion, this really needs to be communicated a lot more to the community and of patients and surgeons to really understand what's mapping really it's not all the school mri like and have it a random abdominal radiologist read it who doesn't know what endometriosis is everything needs to be based on a plan and with an expert radiologist i think yes. that changes the things okay awesome thank you so much this this was one thing i think you are one of the most vocal leader in the world about mapping it just and because probably you, you want to go in the surgery with a plan but when during the surgery, I recently read something about one of the innovations that you have during a surgery done. Monitoring, monitoring, yes, beautifully, yes. Yes, can you can you explain that to us? And uh, I would love to hear that. Yeah, neuromonitoring monitoring something that uh, our team did love thanks to the head of uh, Dr. Ana Sierra. Dr. Ana Sierra went to uh, learn neuropathology with the with the one with the founder of ICON, that it's uh, Dr. Mark Posover. Dr. Mark Posover is the founder of the neuroperbiology school, and Dr. Sierra is the first neuroperbiologist from Latin America, a, a woman. She, with Dr. Posover, came up with the idea of of the monitor the pelvic nerves because we must remind that the nerves carry information to the brain. So during surgery, when it's a, a nerve involvement surgery that there is compression or there's even an infiltration to the sacral or lumbar or of nerves, we can see uh, with a special needles uh, that are in the, in the, remember that the sacral and lumbar uh, nerves carry information of sensibility of the legs, the perineum and the anus and the sphincters. So we can check during surgery if we're getting really close to the nerves when we're cutting. 
because surgery is not like uh, there's labels like, oh, this is a vessel or this is a ureter or this is a nerve. Uh, and in endometriosis, the tissue causes inflammation and inflammation process and that inflammation causes fibrosis and the fibrosis causes additions. So sometimes there's additions so hardened that uh, the bubble is attached to the nerves. And my dad, when they used to do endometrial surgery, sometimes like they put the, the you know, like the clamp and cut. It's like, oh, thanks to God, it didn't bleed. And it's like, my God, that, <laughs> that patient, that was a nerve. And now that patient, uh, you know, it will be without a bowel function or urinary control, or they have to do autocatheterism or sometimes sexual dysfunction. So even my father went outside the surgery, like, yes, this didn't bleed. And then three months after, it's like that patient was with, you know, uh, putting catheters inside. The difference between the metrosis and cancer surgery is that one, that in cancer, as my father can tell you, if a patient come to his R and the patient come up with an ileostomy or has to put a catheter to do pee, the patient still say, thank you very much, doctor, because I'm alive. It's cancer. I was going to be dead. In endometriosis, no. Endometriosis is not cancer. So endometriosis, the rate of, um, of mortality is really low. So endometriosis cannot kill you. But if we do surgery and then you enter with pain and you end up with, you know, a catheter and a you're a catheter for life, I left on me for life because of bowel design function. I don't think that's a good thing for my sister. You get me? So that's the most important part of the nerve monitoring. During surgery, in advanced cases, we have to put this nerve monitoring so we do not damage the nerve function. So that's a, that's an amazing thing to do. And uh, I read about this and it sounded really fascinating. And I hope that's something that most people do because I think nerve damage is something very common, especially if lesion is near the nerves, especially like, you know, big nerves, as you were explaining. And the consequences and side effects could be permanent for lifeline. Yeah, it's even important because we even see many doctors in the U.S. that tell the patients, or here in Mexico, not only the U.S., that the patient go with the mapping of the metamorphosis and they have a nodule really big in the, in the, in the intestine. It's like, if you take that nodule away, you will end up with a nerve damage forever. So you should never take the nodule away. And the patient is like, doctor told me that we should never to, uh, touch the and you're like, who tell you that? And like, yeah, doctor, you know, I OBGYN really famous. You're like, yes, of course, that doctor, a really good OBGYN, really bad expert of deep endometriosis, is even telling misinformation because they didn't understand surgery, they don't understand disease, they don't understand how to do neuromonitoring and also nerve preservation. So yes, it's really if you're going to do a surgery of endometriosis and a non-expert is going to do surgery, it's almost probably that you will get a dysfunction or a complication. Great. Thank you so much for, for explaining that. Um, I asked most of the questions that I had about all the activities you do. I have a couple of personal, almost personal questions for you. I hope you can answer them. If, if you don't like to answer them, it's totally fine. We can uh, go to the next question. So in your personal Instagram, I see a lot of exercise pictures and a lot of times you explain in your caption, this is all in your brain, like power is in your brain, like it's all mental work. So from what age did you start uh, this type of exercise and what do you mean by the power is in your brain? Like it's all mental. Well, my God, it's hard. My father also was a little bit, you know, crazy about sports. My mother used to be a, a national champion of diving and my father used to do amateur um, boxing. So, uh, you know, the conjunction make a gymnast, <laughs> that's me. So, uh, they, I started gy uh, gymnastic school since I was uh, five, six years. And uh, I even become a national champion when I was 14 years old before going to med school. Uh, I, I was going to even compete in the Central Americans and Pan American uh, uh, trials. So uh, when I uh, I go to the CrossFit se sessions or I go to functional, uh, I do a handstand or I can do a backflip or I can do something and they're like, how can you do that? It's like, oh, I have done it my whole life, you know? <laughs> I, I, I think that I have been in handstand more times 
that a normal so it's hard sometimes but yes i did i do think that at some point the brain it's something that i even tell my 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 fellows and my students you will get to the point that your brain wants to get by shame in endometriosis as in sports in his life and you can see this in the recent olympics and sometimes people train for 10 years for a three minute three minute uh, you know a, a sport competition like i did And uh, you have to sacrifice things to get to that point. And also, you also you, it's really important the the skills, uh, natural skills or the innate skills. But we have to remember that discipline beats talent. And I do think that to become a really good surgeon, you have to be disciplined. And you have to be willing to go all the way. You know, you can see a lot of motivation videos go all the way, you versus you, whatsoever. But as well as for my patients, many, many patients, they think that, oh, I will go to Dr. Cabrera or Dr. William and I do surgery and abracadabra, my I even get a million dollars. No. As uh, you have seen, uh, surgery is just the beginning of the process in some patients because they have 20 years of pain. They have even something that is called central sensibilization and peripheral sensibilization that the surgery would remove the inflammatory process. But the new nerve pathways that they already have, we have to change it. We have to change the neurotransmitters in the brain with a psychiatrist so they can get less pain. And, and you know, some patients have anxiety and depression. So if they have anxiety and depression, it's an infinite circle of pain. So we have to change everything. And I always tell my patients, like, never, you know, it's like a sport. You will lose the moment you stop, the moment you, you say, I'm done. You will never see if you will win if you keep trying, just keep trying, just keep trying, just keep trying. And it's the same in endometriosis. If your general practitioner, your OBGYN doesn't believe you, they gaslight you, they demodulate your symptoms, change it. Go educate yourself. Go to someone that understands the disease. If you're going under surgery with the best in the world and after that you still have pain, believe it. it you still have to go under the process of physiotherapy, pain in neuropelviology, but never, never ever in your life, in sports and in life, should you give up. Because if you give up in every, anything, that's the moment you lose. Uh, that's something that it, it's something that we can see in, in, in even motivational videos, but it's true in life. And also for doctors, if you want to become a really good surgeon, and I'm not the best in the world, probably I do. The only thing that probably I have different from other surgeons is that I'm willing to go all the way. I will need to give my family, my life and everything and my accommodations, my vacations to help patients. I really do. And that's why it's the difference between me and many other surgeons. You can see some surgeons like, ah, I'm vacation in Switzerland. Like, oh my God, I have appointments on Sunday. And oh, it's like, Dr. Correa, where are you going to take vacations? Well, I just went to Guatemala. I did nine surgeries and see take patients, help more people. You get me? And sometimes I'm tired and I'm a human being and I get sad. And And I go to duels. I lose people, people that I, I love and things like that. But as I told you, you should, you should be willing to go all the way to change something. And that's the difference between me and many other surgeons. Many others, they believe in, in money. Many others believe in ego. Many others believe in want to be the best. I'm, I'm not like that. I'm trying just to change something. And I do believe that, that my life should have a meaning. That's so motivating. Thank you so much. I want to, next question is actually relevant to what you just said. So you, you set your mind on something and just keep going and there's, it's all mental. Physics will achieve what your mind wants. Yeah. So sometimes this is the next question. Sometimes you are so focused on your goal and in your explanation or in, when you are trying to make a change, you come across as a little aggressive. Do you? <laughs> Well, Do you think so? You agree with that, right? I haven't even noticed. They told me that yes, sometimes uh, because probably uh, how I was raised. Uh, you know, uh, I'm the son of an oncologist, uh, the the best surgeons in the world, who was a boxer. So you can imagine the discipline level. And yes, probably when I see something that is wrong, at some point I get not mad. I used to get mad with other doctors. Now I do not longer get mad. I try to get, uh, you know, like a little bit in positive in the in the issue that I I see my sister involved. You know, it's like 
if we do not change this, there will be someone like my sister that will have pain for 20 years. So imagine uh, that you have a son right now or your, or your uh, wife. Uh, imagine someone that is trying to change in the way that they will be, you know, involved or they will get harm because of this. And you get like, oh my God, how can I change it? Yes. Also, I love it. But I love, I love aggression in work and in perfection. I think that's a very positive attitude, which exactly what you mentioned. When you see a bad surgery, you might get impatient or you want to. So this leads to my last question is that in one of the surgery that I sent to you for review, yeah. you sent some reviews, but you texted me that it was so difficult for you to watch those videos. I don't know if you remember, it was all ablation, like the guy, the surgeon burned. Yeah, I do, I do remember that, yes. What, what's the feeling? What do you feel when you see such surgeries happen in the world and burn the tissue and just go out and you think you have done a good job to patient? I know you mentioned your sister and what, what's the feeling? Well, the feeling is, uh, it's something that, well, obviously I have grown a little bit older and I try to get a little bit more mature each day. Uh, around the five years ago, I will tell you anger. Now, uh, obviously I, I feel anxiety because it's like, oh my God, someone's getting harm and that poor patient would get, you know, dysfunction and pain for many years and many other surgeries. But I also have to be mature and understand that there are things in my, in that I cannot control. The only things that I can control are my, my emotions and also my paths and my my work so i do feel uh unhopeful at some point and i also feel that uh that uh, we have to change it so it's a little bit like a fuel to keep working hard you know because at some point that doctor will understand that the, uh, this is not new five years ago ten years ago when we started the mapping and all that even they used to tell me, you're crazy. This is cannot be seen in MRIs. Uh, the surgery is so hard. You're damaging the patients. Uh, you should not be doing bowel resections because you're an OBGYN. And how are you treating the heart and cutting the precardium? And you know, the, the good things that keep working and keep working hard and keep working hard is the same thing like when I was doing gymnastics. And they told me, uh, uh, you know, a triple double, you know, something It's like, that's impossible. You're too tall. You're too big. You're too, we're more weight than the normal gymnast. And then I went and do it. So it's kind of the same, you know, it's a discipline. I think that at some point you have to understand that the more discipline and many people think that some things are impossible. My dad used to think that this was impossible until someone do it. And it's the same, every, everything, you know, we're having a video conversation. Three years ago, this was impossible. So I think that that's the most important thing to do, to keep, keep on going, keep the good work. I do think that uh, someone like, I know Steve Jobs or something, do believe in someone that created the video call. Probably he didn't do it. So that's the same I'm doing. I'm, I'm trying to find, you know, like right now, a new fellow from Argentina who is new, is coming, she's good. I will try to make my best to make her grow and to, you know, be the best surgeon. You know, I, I will not even try to, to save something for me. It's like, oh no, I will not tell her this so I can be, no, everything. So you can be better than me, you get me? And she will get better than me at some point and I will be so pleased because my, my, my life is not eternal. I don't want to be the best. I want someone to be creative all the time because someone with a bigger brain or the best things or best thoughts that I do have will have better things to do. They will come up with something better than mapping. They will come up something that the end block technique or the nerve preservation techniques. They will come up with, I don't know, probably even a genetic cure or whatsoever. That will be because of someone like me that believe in them and give them everything, you know, like, yes, whatever you need. So that's something that makes me a little bit, when I saw that type of surgeries, I do now think of the other opposite side of the coin and try to make the, the people who wants to be better to grow, grow and grow and grow. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Since you mentioned crazy and Steve Jobs, actually Steve Jobs says the people who are crazy enough, who can change, who think they can change the world, yes. they are the one who changed the world.
Yes, yes. Yes, I yes. know. I think that everyone that do endo have a little bit of crazy inside of it. William, oh my God, William is crazy as me. And, and you got to meet him in first hand, uh, Dr. Zavala, Armando Menocal, Sierra. All of us are a little bit with something, you know, neuro, neurodivergence, are, as they tell, but we all have something in common that it's to make, uh, you know, better for patients. As you, you probably can do something else in life and you have gone through a lot. Many doctors are against you. Many patients are against you. It's like, how oh, a patient can be against me. <laughs> it's like I'm trying to, you know, to change things for them. And the good thing is that my father, my grandfather used to say, you're not like a golden coin. You're not like a gold coin. You will not, you, you someone will not like you. Probably there are some, there are doctors that it's like, oh, I do remember one time I did a handstand and publish online. It's like, stop, stop telling lies to other doctors that you can have that type of life, like a big life and being a doctor. Like, what? <laughs> it's like, dude, like I, I trade for 15 years. Uh, that's a difference between you and me. It's, it's hard. It's hard sometimes. Uh, you know, that's why we get together. Maybe we have disagreement. You tell us. Uh, I have disagreement sometimes with Sierra. I have disagreement with other guys, you know, who are friends at the end. But we are at the end together for a reason. You get me? And that's uh, the reason is the patience. So I totally agree. And I love what you said. So when we call, when you say crazies, you call a couple of doctors like, Dr. Kondo, Zavala, Ana Sierra, these are like, I think the most talented people now in the endo community. And with you, all of you, with other doctors also, Dr. Um, Fabian Walters and Dr. Carlos, you have created this uh, in innovative center called Endo Global Group. And uh, a couple of months ago, I mean, it has been in the process for a few years. A couple of months ago was like officially announced can you explain to us what is it and why did you think there is a need for it? Yeah, well, and the global group came as the answer for the necessity of North American patients of the really uh, low quality treatment that they, they have. Because Canada and the U.S. are first countries, many of the patients uh, have insurance and they go, the first thing they go is to a general practitioner. And the general practitioner is not an expert in endometriosis and they stay there for 10 years. The, the delay in diagnosis in first world countries around five to seven years. And that's just to hear the world endometriosis. Uh, by shame, there are really, really few amount of doctors that have mappings of deep endometriosis. Uh, and there are even fewer that can do full surgery, excision therapy. Even though you have a robotic surgery and probably the Mayo Clinic and the best hospitals in the world, they're the best hospital in the world for chronic diseases like diabetes and chronic hypertension. But in deep endometriosis, U.S. and Canada are considered like the lowest scores for treatment. So many patients get gaslight, then they don't understand uh, nerve function and many other stuff. So Dr. Zavala, uh, uh, when he starts seeing all of this, because he's really close to the board and he's a U.S. citizen, he started understanding that uh, we need a center like the one here in Mexico City or like the one in, in Curitiba with Professor William that can give the answer to these patients in North America. And so that's why the global group came as an idea of bringing the best surgeons in the world, who is not only me or William. As you can saw, there's been Marcelo Chacaroni, uh, one of the best Italian surgeons, uh, Dr. Reitan Rivero, the best oncologist in the world in, from Brazil, who has developed many techniques in oncology. One of the best in the world, like Professor Nuselio in Canada, who is one of the best in neuropathologists as well, as Dr. Sierra. And uh, we're planning to bring the best of the world to the treatment of these patients. Because Tijuana is a unique geographic localization that is the most cross-border border, right, worldwide. And that state is just for healthcare or foreign years. So uh, they're doing, and uh, it was uh, really crazy when bariatric surgery was in the uh, Tijuana was one of the biggest cities of bariatric surgery, as well as plastic surgery and dental care. So uh, Dr. Zavala lives in Tijuana and understand the necessity of this center in Tijuana because we can solve the full problem for North America. Uh, our center can achieve up to 15 to 20 surgeries per week. Uh, obviously we will not treat 20 million women, but we can uh, help with the waiting list. In Canada, the waiting list sometimes is one to two years. In the US, the problem is that some of them, they don't even have insurance. 
And uh, even to get to a, a special doctor like uh, Gabi Mowat is a uh, waiting list of one year, Eugenio the same. So some of the patients are in an excruciating pain, like my sister, and they do have, and they do deserve the best surgeon in the OR, and they do deserve the best of the best in mapping and the best of the best in nutrition and whatsoever. So that's why EndoGlobal will grow as probably the best center in the world to treat the patient from North America. Amazing. Thanks for sharing that. And what do you think is the most challenging uh, part for patients to come and get surgery from EndoGlobal? The most challenging part of, for patients is obvious. The, the trouble uh, to a foreign country, you know, that you don't even know uh, uh, the, the place. You don't even, uh, you can see the videos and you can see whatsoever, but it's not the same as, as, as you go to any vacations. When you go to Italy, it's like in Italy, you can get scammed and you can get pink pocket and whatsoever. So many patients, uh, they're like, oh, do I have to go to Mexico that it's a, a developing country and I live in the U.S. and probably I live in, I don't know, Beverly Hills, you know, and, and how am I, if my, if my doctor is the head surgeon of Mayo Clinic, well, the, the head surgeon of Mayo Clinic hasn't developed a technique of deep endometriosis like myself, you get me? So that surgeon is the one who should not be doing endometriosis is good. So uh, even if they have robotic surgery or uh, whatsoever, they are not an expert and they don't have the learning curve like we have. So many patients, they do have, you know, like, like, oh my God, the trust issue. Like I have to go overseas, but I have seen patients from Egypt. I have seen patients from India. I have patients from New Zealand. And it's like, oh my God, you came across the world to see me in an appointment and to do a surgery. And I feel so honored, you know? So uh, many, uh, you have been now in the global, we have approached every time we go around 15 to 20 surgeries and we have, uh, have many patients. With the, by reasons, the, many of the, of the <laughs> clinical cases are really big. Uh, that's why it's really beautiful to have uh, not one top surgeon. We have three uh, at the same OR is William, myself, Dr. Uh, Dr. Nuselio, Dr. Uh, Reitan, who has the best in the world. So imagine. Not having one of the best in the world in the war for your surgery to have the best three. Like if you're going to do a, you know, a plastic surgery, you might have the top three surgeons of plastic surgery. Imagine your surgery is going to be, that's it. That's amazing. I love the idea of Endo Global. I think it really makes care and top quality care accessible to many people that needed to wait for years or travel across the oceans. And now they have access to it in a great center. So thank you so much for your time and I really appreciate everything you said, sharing your knowledge. Is there anything that you want to say as the last words? Well, last words, well, if there was a wish that I couldn't, I couldn't say, you know, there are many wishes, but if there's a wish right now, it will be like, if we can change just education of, men, of you know, menses in women, uh, the majority will know, will sometimes no go as far as the diaphragm, the lung or the, you know, the intestine. I think that the education is the main issue worldwide for patients with endometriosis. This type of disease, because of the taboo, they don't talk about it. Many governments doesn't even care because like, is this cancer? No. Does it kill the patient? No. What does it cause? Oh, infertility and chronic pain. It's like, okay, no money for that. Money for cancer, you know, <laughs> it's like, okay. So I think that just by educating the patients, they will get better. Obviously, uh, it's really important if you have endometriosis to get to an expert. And if you do not have an expert and you're in the U.S. or Canada, there are centers like in the Global Group, uh, there are centers like our center in Mexico City, like other centers in, around the U.S., like the Atlanta Center, like the Miami Center, that do have uh, experts. So go there. That's it. Uh, it's the best and the most uh, good in in investment of money that you're going to do because you will not go through five surgeries like, like my sister did. My sister went to the U.S. to get an ablation surgery, but like, oh my God. So uh, if I could save my sister uh, all that chronic pain, 20 years of pain, losing babies and partners, I will save it immediately with my close eyes. I will not even think about it. So I will give that advice to them. Thank you so much and thank you for your time. No, please. It was my pleasure always. I hope to see you soon.